doing? Um, how's um, life been going for yourself, I guess, since the season ended a few weeks ago? Good. We've had the last couple of weeks off. So next week we're getting ready to gear up and head into our off season training, um, which will be intense. So I'm excited to get started. That's awesome. Do you have any off season plans? Like what are you hoping to work on? I guess. Uh, it'll be a really heavy emphasis on conditioning, strength, um, things that might've tired us out during the season that now, now that we don't have games, we can kind of focus in on some of those areas. Yeah, and um, how excited are you to see your teammates again after not seeing all of them all at once for a few weeks, I guess? Very excited. Very excited. Yeah. Now, I want to transition and talk about the beginning of your hockey career and kind of work all the way up to where you are now today with Penn State. So, obviously, you're from Calgary, Alberta. Um, talk about growing up there, and how did you start playing hockey? Uh, I have a really influential uh, player in my life. He's my dad. He uh, he played all the way through. He played some pro hockey, and um, being from Canada and being from Calgary, hockey is, it's the, it's our football, if you will. It's, uh, it's the most popular sport for us by far. And um, so I kind of got into it following in my dad's footsteps, going out, um, going out with him every now and then when he was skating. And he kind of taught me to skate at a pretty young age. So from there on, it was, it was never figure skating or, or dance or anything like that. It was always hockey in my house. So um, that's kind of how I got into it. What pro team did your dad play for? He played in the American League with uh, the Rangers organization and the Oilers for a bit. That's awesome. And what's it like kind of growing up with a father figure that's playing pro hockey? Because not many um, kids get to say that their dad played pro hockey before. So I think that's pretty cool. It's, it's incredible. His, his knowledge of the game, his, uh, his ability in a lot of ways to be unbiased as well or as unbiased as he can, where he can, he can give me that knowledge and give me his opinions regardless of me being his daughter and just even from a hockey player standpoint. So there's a lot of things I've learned about the game and learned about um, how to go through, how to play the right way, all those things that if I didn't have him, I wouldn't know. So I've been very, very lucky to, uh, to have that knowledge from him. Yeah. And was he your favorite player growing up or was it someone else, maybe someone in the NHL or was it a women's player on the national team by any chance? Um, I would say I probably have a couple favorite players. My dad, I never got to see him play. He was, he was done when I was born, but him always, um, I was a huge Jonathan Taves fan coming up. Um, he's uh, one of the biggest reasons that I like the Blackhawks. Just his game is 200 foot game is incredible. Um, and then there's a few women's players, Blair Turnbull, Brianne Jenner, um, some real power forwards that I really like to watch play. So you didn't grow up a Flames fan uh, being from Calgary. I think that's pretty interesting. Yeah, not, not really at all, actually, until uh, recently when Daryl Sutter took over for them as a coach. Um, then now I'm starting to really like them. But for the longest time, I was strictly a Blackhawks fan. Yeah, I guess it makes sense since the Blackhawks aren't doing that well. And Jonathan Taze didn't play last year, so it must have been tough to watch that team without him. Exactly. Yep. Now, before college hockey, you played for the Pursuit of Excellence School. So talk about your experience with that school and uh, what did you take away from your whole experience um, with that program? I had an unbelievable experience with uh, Pursuit of Excellence, or POE, um, as we call them. I started with them my grade 10 or sophomore year, and – like I have nothing but incredible things to say about their coaching staff, the players. I met some of my best friends there. Uh, you're on the ice for two hours every day, working out for one and then skills for one. So school is definitely, um, it's a component, but hockey is, is the biggest part. And that was just so much fun. Did you get to play with any um, cool players um, when you were with that program? Because doing some research, there were some division one commits that have gone there before. Yeah, every year there's uh, there's quite a few come out of that team. But my uh, my first year in particular, I got to play with girls like Dara Gregg, Danielle Serdakny, um, Steph Markowski, and Tchaikovsky, if you know any of those names. Um, all Rachel Weiss, who's on my team now, all girls who played in the, the U18 Team Canada system. And they were incredible role models for me. And um, they kind of helped me get to that, uh, that, D1, that D1 place and um, showed me kind of what it takes as well as being some of my best friends off the ice. That must have been cool to play with Serdakny, especially since she's one of the best players in the ECAC right now. Yeah, she's, she's incredible. I now, have nothing but good things to say about her. Now, how did you get the opportunity to go to that school and play for that program? It actually all started for me. I wasn't going to go, but I ended up going to their spring showcase. Um, every spring they have schools, NCAA, U-Sport, um, university schools come down and, 
Um, I was playing in Calgary at the time and some of my buddies were, were going to this showcase. So I just thought I'd kind of hop, hop in for the ride and go get some ice time. And I ended up playing pretty well. I was pretty young and um, kind of started talking to Chris Hogg, who's the head coach of that team. And it all happened very fast, but um, that's kind of how I got my start with them. And he took me in and started developing me from there. Now, what's the best memory you have with the pursuit of excellence school? Did you win any championships or was it any, some, was it some off ice memory that you had not even an on ice memory? I have countless off ice memories with, with that team, but I think the couple that stand out the most would be my first year. Again, we won the Stony Creek championship, which is a huge tournament in Canada. And then we ended up winning our, our league as well. Um, that team was uh, pretty much undefeated the whole year, and it was a lot of fun to play. And how did the Pursuit of Excellence School help prepare you for college hockey? Because obviously it's producing a lot of Division One commits. So, like, how do they develop you into a better hockey player when you start off with that program and then when you leave? Strictly time in a lot of ways. Uh, we spend so much time on the ice every day, Monday through Friday, two hours on the ice doing skill development, um, games, and keeps it fun. Uh, our coach is one of the best. Uh, like I said, Chris Hogg, he's, he's really good at making sure that even though we're on the ice every day, we're having fun every day. And he's holding us to this, this standard of this standard of excellence without, uh, in other words, I guess. And um, that, that hour, those hours are, it's actually an adjustment the other way when you come from there and you're doing that many hours, four hours every day, um, even to college where you're doing kind of two or three and it just allows you to be mentally tough enough to get through that training, get through kind of anything you need to in college because they're used to that time already. Yeah, it also sounds like you learned how to adjust both school and hockey at such an elite level, which many players don't have the opportunity to do that just because of the way um, high school works out. So that must have been a huge benefit for yourself um, heading into Penn State. Absolutely. Yeah, we, uh, we have a little bit of a different school situation there, but you definitely had to manage because we had so much hockey. You had to make sure you were getting your classwork done. And we were on the road every weekend. So we had to learn also early how to, uh, how to do homework on the road and stay in touch with your teachers and um, make sure that you have everything handled. What's the secret for doing homework on the road? <sighs> Tough. I won't lie to you. It's uh, just discipline more than anything. Just making sure that you sit down and do it, whether that's when you get to the hotel, um, some people get really car sick, myself included. So um, doing it on the bus might be not be an option, but making sure that you're taking time, whether that's maybe sacrificing a 20 minute nap and um, or a, a snack here, or a snack there, and just making sure that you're getting all your work done. Yeah, I don't know if I could do it on the bus just because every time I, I don't know if you've ever like read on like a car, but it makes me like, makes my, I have a huge headache after. So I don't know like how some of those people get to do homework on the bus. I kind of, I kind of, I'm kind of jealous because I feel like you can save some time by doing it that way. Yeah, absolutely. I, there are a lot of people who can't, I'm kind of like you, I, I struggle with it. If I have to do it, I will, but I kind of avoid it at all costs. Now you didn't play hockey last year before heading off to college. So my question is, what'd you do during that time period to kind of improve? And um, what was it like not ha having a year off from just playing any real games? It was really, really tough. Um, it's one of those things that you're doing all the work and you're not seeing really any of the, any of the rewards. You're not getting to win games. You're not getting to, to play with your teammates, be in those intense situations, all the things we really love about hockey. Um, so it was definitely a difficult year, but uh, those hours that I was kind of previously mentioning, they stayed the same. So instead of doing kind of an in-season training block, we had eight months of off-season. So just pushing hard, pushing hard, ton of conditioning, ton of cardio, lots of skills. Um, and we didn't, we didn't do those kind of slower moving pieces like the systems, um, power plays and that kind of thing. It was just very intense battle practices all the time. What was your mindset, I guess, heading into that year? Because I don't, for most people, they didn't know they were going to have a full year off of hockey. It was kind of like they found out like towards like December and January month. So kind of like what was your mindset during that year when you weren't playing any games? And how did you kind of prepare for that? Since not a lot of players um, before you had had a year off of, of hockey before heading off to college, it's kind of unheard of. But obviously with the circumstances, the way they were, you had to kind of have be in that situation. Yeah, for us, like we were kind of in that boat too. We didn't know it was always, we might get games next month. We might get games. Um, so 
every month, you're just trying to prepare for the next block of games. So even though it can be a little bit defeating when it gets pushed back and it ended up being pushed back kind of inevitable or indefinitely, um, it was just thinking about what's next always. Um, even though it was, it was very, very difficult at times to stay motivated, to, to go to the gym, to show up at practice when you knew you were just doing the same thing every day. But you just have to always think, okay, we think we're playing in February. I have to be ready to play in February. Um, okay, we're not playing. We're playing in March. Got to be ready to play in March. So you're always just looking um, at that next next step. And I do think that it is it was tough for Canadian recruits coming in this year that didn't get to play at all. Um, American recruits did, but that's kind of you have to take what you're given and run with it. So. Did you feel like you had a catch up at all heading into college with all those players that at least had some playing time under their belts in the previous year? Or did you feel like you were kind of in the same level as everyone else? I think that the biggest thing that was a hard adjustment was just gameplay again. Um, physically, it's always a jump. You're playing with players who are four years older or um, sometimes bigger, sometimes stronger, all those things. So no matter what, it's a bit of an adjustment. Um, even if you are at that level, you have to get used to playing with other players at that level. And so I think that that was a big adjustment, but also the actual speed of gameplay going from not even playing high school games to jumping into college games was definitely a little bit of like a, a wake up, like, okay, this is faster, this is harder. And you kind of have to, you're thrown into it and you got to make it work. So. Now I want to start off talking about your recruitment process with Penn State. Um, talk about that. What was that process like for yourself? What made you want to go to Penn State versus other schools you might have looked at? So I actually have a very strange recruiting process. Um, I was recruited in grade 10 to go to Ohio, um, Ohio State. And then with COVID and a couple other things, it just it just didn't work out, um, whether that be keeping extra seniors, scholarship money, all of that stuff. So I kind of came back on the back on the market, you could say, at, in November of my grade 12 year. Um, and then I was talking to a few other schools and the culture at Penn State, the, the energy of Penn State and the, the resources of Penn State, just they drew me in. And um, that was a huge part of me making my decision. Was it was it kind of scary, I guess, to decommit from a school and be back on, I guess, the market in some sense and try to look for another school? Because obviously, like I said before, this is a situation that no one's ever experienced before. So were you nervous at all or were you excited to kind of get back on the recruiting process and find a school that fit for you? Both. Both. My, my high school coach was incredible about it. He had me um, on the phone so fast that there wasn't really time for me to think, oh gosh, like, I don't know if I'm going to find something or um, that kind of fear of like, what if I don't get a spot? Um, so I was very, very lucky that he has the connections that he does, that I was kind of able to talk to people or talk to coaches right away. Um, he had me kind of immediately in conversation. And so that kind of eased those nerves. Um, it definitely is an adjustment thinking you're going one way and then COVID hits and you're not going that way anymore. And um, that's really, really difficult. But um, I found a new home at Penn State and here I am. Yeah, I feel like first, obviously COVID has done a lot of negative things towards many people's lives, but I feel like sometimes you have to look at the positive side of things. And I feel like sometimes COVID might have been a positive for certain aspects of people's lives. And it seems like to me, just talking with you, that going to Penn State worked out very well for yourself. And it wouldn't even happen if it wasn't for the pandemic, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it has its ups and downs always, but um, ending up here was, was a great thing. Now, you were talking about some of the adjustments you had to make to college hockey. Um, what was actually the biggest adjustment you had to make? Was it the speed of the game? Was it kind of the mental side of the game, making quicker decisions with the puck? Or was it the physicality part, like you were mentioning, since you're going against older players, but also players that might be a little bit bigger and stronger than you are? I think the physicality for myself. Um, it also, it's very different styles of play, um, all those things. And I think that the biggest thing for me was adjusting to the new strength of uh, all the other players that I was playing against and something that I'll have to work on kind of to this day. But um, as far as the speed of the play and the decision-making of the play, that kind of sped up for me pretty quick and I was able to pick that up. But um, definitely the, the size and strength of some of the older players is going to be something that I continue to adjust to. Now talk about what it's like playing in your conference, the CHA, and just the competition you face every night. And obviously Robert Morris is coming back next year, so you haven't even played every team yet. So just from your experience so far, what's that conference like? It's a bit of a smaller conference, but I feel like it's a very underrated conference from what I've seen so far. 
Absolutely. Um, there's teams in that conference that were not necessarily considered the strongest. And um, then we'll play out of conference games and beat big teams. So it's definitely kind of an underdog of a conference. It's a heavy conference. Um, very, very different from anything I've experienced before. Very, like I said, physical, heavy, um, and just hard, hard to play in. And um, that that's kind of the biggest difference, I would say, from even somewhere like the ECAC, where there's lots of speed, lots of skilled players. Um, the CHA is very, like, hard hitting. Um, so I think that that's probably the, the biggest discrepancy between CHA and other, other leagues. Yeah, and like you were saying, like I feel like a lot of people were sleeping on RIT, and then obviously in the playoffs they made it all the way to the semifinals. So you just never know where you're going to get from teams, and it feels like it's a very strong conference that develops a lot of good players, and hopefully it gets more recognition as the years go on. But getting back to the next question about just yourself individually, um, what was the biggest improvement you think you made to your game this year? You are talking about all the adjustments you had to make kind of uh, just adjusting from not playing hockey again until getting back into college hockey. So what were some improvements you feel like you made to your game this year that you think are going to be beneficial for yourself heading into your sophomore season? Uh, I think one of the biggest uh, adjustments that I've made that has benefited me is just the, uh, I guess you could say cleverness around the offensive net, um, making some plays that um, I can now make kind of more at that college level and um, adjusting to those that speed and that decision-making um, process where I think that I've kind of made some strides in taking pucks to the net faster, moving pucks to the net faster, and just creating shots um, kind of from everywhere. Do you think uh, you will pull off a Michigan move at some point this year or you're not there quite yet? That's the dream, isn't it? Yes. I feel like everyone's trying to do it now, which is crazy. I don't know how you try to defend that. I don't know if they even tell you in college, like they teach you, do they teach you how to defend that since it's starting to become more common or not really? I've never experienced anyone teaching how to defend that. Um, I feel like once you see it, you might be more inclined to, to try to defend it. It's definitely something that you don't see very often. So once we see it, we might, we might try to defend mm -hmm. it a little bit more effectively. Yeah. Well, hopefully you can at least attempt it at some point in your college hockey career. That'd be pretty cool. At least you can go back to this moment saying you were thinking about it. And at, least, at least it can be on tape. I think that'd be pretty cool. That would be very cool. I agree. Now let's talk about some of the big moments that happened in your season um, this year. The first biggest moment, at least in my opinion for you individually, was when you got your first collegiate goal against Mercyhurst. I'll talk about what it was like in your first collegiate goal against a big rival, and who did you call first after the game? It was an incredible feeling, um, especially in the situation that we were in. Freshman, you're trying to earn your spot, you're trying to make your stride, and so I was kind of given a shot really in that game. And made the best of it. So first person I called would definitely be my family, my mom and my dad back home in, in Calgary. And my puppy Todd heard all the whole conversation as well. He gets to hear all of that. But um, mom and dad were definitely my first call. And uh, I had some overwhelming support from my teammates. They were all extremely excited for me. And it, it was a great feeling. Where do you keep the puck? Or did you even get to keep it? It's sitting in my in my shelves right now, actually, in my dorm room. Awesome. That's really cool. Are you going to bring it back home um, after the season and keep it in Calgary? Or are you going to constantly bring it to you back to Penn State uh, for your sophomore? I think I'll junior? leave it here. Yeah, I think awesome. I'll leave it here. Yeah. Awesome. I feel like that's a good decision just because like it's your college goal. It should be um, back in college, in my opinion. At least that's how I feel about it. I agree. Yeah. Now, another big thing that happened this season was um, – you beat Minnesota Duluth in Washington, D.C., obviously pulling off that big upset. And it's a really big win now, especially since Duluth's in the Frozen Four. So how important was that non-conference win for your team, especially for your freshman class, getting that big win? And um, just talk about what it was like being a part of that um, upset, I guess. It was really great exposure to some of the best players in the NCAA. And to win that that game gave us some confidence, some um, yeah, some, I guess you could say some swag that we realized, okay, we can hang with teams that are in what's considered the best league or best conference in the NCAA and probably is the best conference in the NCAA, and we can, we can do it. Um, so I think that the challenge for us will be taking the intensity from that weekend and from that game and carrying it with us moving forward and just remembering that we did that because we, we did upset a really, really good team, and I think that we have the potential to upset even better teams down the road. It may maybe be like one of those ranked teams that people are looking to upset. That's obviously the goal, which people don't really talk about a lot, I feel like. Exactly. 
Now talk about your experience in Washington, D.C. How cool was that to go over to the Capitol? And did you get to do anything fun um, when you were down there besides playing hockey, obviously? Yeah, we did a lot of exploring. I spent a lot of time with my family. Um, they were uh, nice enough to come join me that weekend. So I spent a lot of time with them. And it was just the intensity of that weekend, the, uh, the constant, like, almost buzz of, okay, this is this is real. This is happening. We're playing out of conference. It's it's a very like high energy uh, environment, especially with the amount of fans that were there. The stands were packed. You're playing some of the best teams, and there's nothing better than a tournament style like that. What was some of the cool sites you got to see? Did you get to see like the White House, the Washington Monument, any museums in particular? Uh, no museums in particular, but both of those um, and the I forget what it's called, but the um, the big pond and the, the yeah. memorial yes yes yeah that. yeah no, that's that's cool it's is it kind of weird seeing those stuff in real life because i feel like sometimes like you see them in photos all the time but then once you see in real life it's like kind of underwhelming i don't know if did you have that experience at all or was it like really cool to see it in person for me it was cool to see it in person because i don't hear about those monuments a lot um where i'm from so it was kind of a uh not a wake up because we do spend a lot of time actually on American history and everything in school, but it was just cool to kind of see those monuments up close, having heard so little about them and getting to learn a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And I was told that you guys also got to go to a Capitals game as well when you were in DC. How was that? It was incredible. It was a lot of fun. Did Ovechkin get a goal or no? I don't think he did that game actually, which I was kind of sad about, but that's yeah. okay. At least you got to see, I think they won that game from what I was told. So that must have been nice to see that at least. Yes. Now, another big moment that happened this season for your team was when you swept UNH to end off the first half of the season. Uh, just talk about that, that non-conference sweep and what it meant to you, and how, how fun was that trip heading out east, since I feel like Penn State doesn't usually do that that often, at least from uh, my experience watching college hockey. Yeah, it was a, definitely a long trip. Spent a lot of hours on the bus that weekend, but kind of same as that Duluth weekend. You, we, have, we are kind of in an underrated conference, and to go out of conference and sweep someone, it gives you that, like, okay, we're, we're here, and we're here to stay, and uh, we're better than some people give the CHA credit for. Now, what was your favorite moment from your freshman year that you can think of? Was it a particular goal that you scored, or was it a win um, that you kind of looked back on, and that was a pretty fun win to be a part of? Oh, God, that's a tough question. Um, the first goal is always an incredible feeling. Um, and I would actually say that weekend in D.C. was a highlight. Uh, the only other thing I can think of kind of non-hockey related was getting here and experiencing the football and the, the Big Ten atmosphere has been incredible as well as some incredible times with my teammates. Yeah. Did you get to go to that whiteout game? Because that looks super fun. I'm not a big college football fan, believe it or not. I'm a huge college hockey guy, but not really a big college football guy. But at one college football game that I'd always wanted to go to was the Penn State wideout game, just because it looks like super fun atmosphere to be a part of. I was wondering if you had the chance to go to that game, and if you did, what was that like? We did, and it was electric. Like, that environment, there's, I've never experienced anything like that. The fans, uh, you do, I would recommend if you go, go early, because we almost lost an arm and a leg getting in there, but um, it was well worth it. Yeah, that's cool. How do you plan out your like white out outfit? Do they like give out stuff like in the school or do you have to like find something like in Target or something like that? You kind of figure it out for yourself, whatever you have either in your closet or yeah, go there's a McClanahan's um, mm -hmm. that has a ton of Penn State merchandise and there's tons of bookstores and Penn State stuff kind of downtown. Mm -hmm. So lots of people end up just going there and either getting big t-shirts or cutting them or whatever that looks like. I feel like it's probably easy, harder for uh, girls to find out outfits for the whiteout than guys because it usually for a guy you just have to find like a white t-shirt but I feel like it's a little more outfit planning for you guys at least. Girls take it very seriously that's for sure. Now another question I want to ask you was uh, what do you feel like you want your team to accomplish in your sophomore season and how you try to make that accomplishment happen like when you look back on this particular season? I think for us having lost uh, obviously I wasn't a part of last year but um, having lost now twice in the semifinals, a goal for us is going to be making it to those finals and winning the CHAs so that we can get that NCAA tournament experience. Um, I think that we, we have the opportunity to do that with a strong freshman class coming in and um, some really strong girls kind of moving up through their years here at Penn State. So I think that we have the opportunity to do that and it's just going to be 
um, coming together as a group and deciding that we're doing this and it's going to happen and there's no way that we're not going to let that happen. Have you had the chance to meet any of the upcoming freshmen or not yet? I have actually. They've come on some some official visits and they all seem like great girls. And like how would you evaluate your team's performance I guess this year? Um, obviously your team had a lot of success in the regular season and do you think um, do you think there's some things you can take away from I guess from this past year into your sophomore season? Definitely. I mean, there's always there's always things to work on. I think that we could be a little bit more consistent um, in our gameplay, but we have a lot of good things that we can kind of take into next season and just continue to build. And what's like the biggest thing you learned this year in college hockey? Um, just in particular, was it like, I guess, some gameplay or systems or was it just something that you didn't even expect to happen this year that you learned that you think is going to be helpful uh, for next season? I think just that you have to adjust your 100 percent. Um, in high school and in other levels, like you have what your 100% is. And as you move up, that has to change. So when you think that you're done, you've got you to gotta find that next year. And I think that that's kind of what college all the way through this year, I've had to learn that, that what your 100% was in high school might not cut it as your 100% in college. Now, one thing I want to ask you, since but when we were recording this, the Frozen Four is obviously coming to um, Penn State. Um, how exciting is it for a player at Penn State for the Frozen Four to be going to Pagula and are you planning to go to any of those games or you're just trying to kind of not think about it, I guess. It is bittersweet. Um, I am going to go because I love watching hockey and I want to, I want to see those teams face off. Um, but it is definitely bittersweet to see your own rink kind of turned into someone else's uh, home. And uh, especially um, our, our boards, our uh, logos, they're all kind of been turned into frozen four and we just, we wish we were a part of it, but Obviously, there's going to be some incredible hockey played, and we're excited to watch it. Yeah, and um, do you guys get to practice at Pagula, or like, do you have to like move to another spot um, when the Frozen Four begins? Because I've been told that like when the Frozen Four begins, like usually those teams like own that part of the rink for at least the weekend. Yeah, so we're fortunate enough to have kind of two arenas in our arena. So the main one, the one that they'll be using for the Frozen Four, that will pretty much be theirs and then we have the community arena which is in the same building just a walk down the hallway that we'll kind of have access to next week that's awesome that's awesome well hopefully you have some fun watching those games and who, who do you have like, I know this this is going to come out after the frozen four but who do you have winning the frozen four? Oh god that is a tough question there are some seriously good players on every single team um I, obviously I think the favor right now is Ohio State uh but I really don't know who's going to take it because there are some incredible talents on every team. I said it was going to be Minnesota Gophers and they got upset, I guess, in the regional semifinal. And that surprised me a lot just from the talent they have in that roster. So I, it, I feel like it's really anyone's to win. I'm going to go with Northeastern just because they were there last year. And I feel like, I don't know, maybe that revenge factor will come into play um, for this year, trying to get back over the top and be champions instead of runners up. Yeah, they, and they do have that experience, not only in the Frozen Four, but in the finals. So that'll be very, very useful for them. But it's going to obviously be a tough game against Duluth, especially since they beat Duluth in the Frozen Four last year. So it should be, that should be a fun game to watch. But kind of getting back to uh, just one more question is just um, what, uh, what's, like the, what's like the big uh, – I already asked that. So we're now in the segment I like to call the non-hockey segment, where I ask you some non-hockey questions just to get to know you a little bit more. Um, my first question to you was, which arena has the best warm-up mix, in your opinion? Because I've been told that Pagula has the best warm-up mix from players on other teams, not just on Penn State. It's Pagula. Absolutely. <laughs> we have our, uh, we have our uh, way we go about it kind of every game. And we have our walkout video. The lights go down. Um, we have our, our songs that play every time. There's just – there's no warm-up mix like Pagula's. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, what is your guilty pleasure song? Probably Man Eater by Nelly Furtado. Love that song. If there was a movie made about your life, who would you want to play yourself? This one's kind of off the wall a little bit, but probably Ryan Reynolds, even though mm -hmm. he's a dude. He's yeah. He's Canadian. He's hilarious. I would say yeah. Ryan Reynolds. That's pretty cool. And Blake Lively would probably be in that movie as well. So that makes it even better. Two good actors. You know, so. Yeah. Yeah. What is the craziest dream you've ever had? One time I had a dream that. I was flying into like some weird planet and it was it's so random and I barely remember it, but I just remember waking up so confused. I had no idea where I was and it was just, it was not my favorite experience. 
I had a dream where I woke up in a dream, if that makes any sense. Like yeah, I woke up yeah, and I was like totally. in my bed, like, like a, what I would do in the morning. And it was just very confusing when I woke up. So that's probably mine. Now talking about some of your teammates, um, who has the best style on Penn State women's hockey? Like whenever you do your pregame outfits, walk into the rink, like who's someone's outfit that you feel like always pulls up? Who's someone on the team that you feel like always pulls off great outfits? Well, if I had to say who has the best clothes, I would say one of my best friends on the team, Carly Garcia. She's kind of outfitting the whole team here and there. She's got her her cool jackets and stuff that everyone's borrowing. But if I had to pick two people probably that have the best all-around style, they always show up showing out. And um, it would probably be maybe even three. I would say Avery Mitchell, um, Mallory Uline, and Amy Dobson. Uh, always they never fail to uh, to surprise me, and they never disappoint. What are some of the outfits they pull off? That's like makes you a very which makes you impressed by it. Dobby's style is a little bit off the wall. She has these pieces that you wouldn't necessarily think to either put together or that you would think that she would even own. But for some reason, she just totally makes it work. Uh, Mal is definitely a little bit more classic. Like she kind of brings in those those like darker black, whatever. Um, she looks very sleek all the time. And Avery, she just looks like a, she owns a Fortune 500 company all the time. That's awesome. Now, who's the funniest teammate you have on Penn State Women's Hockey? Oh, God. Um, probably a couple of my really, really close friends. I think Lindy, Maeve, and Carly are hilarious. Avery Mitchell's also hilarious. But I honestly have so many funny teammates that I don't even think I could put one on there I could probably list over half the team is just hilarious now who is the most interesting teammate in your opinion <sighs> Alyssa Machado she there's things about that girl that I just have no idea what's going on and it's incredible if you had to pick any teammate to cook a meal for you which teammate would you choose Amy Dobson hands down she made the best Thanksgiving she did a Canadian Thanksgiving dinner for all of us who are away from home and it was incredible. She cooks for her roommates all the time, and she is the best cook. She's so good. She cooked a whole Thanksgiving meal for the team. That's pretty incredible. She did. She did a great job of it, too. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, is there any, like, like well, does she have, like, an Instagram, like, food account? Because I feel like a lot of people um, have that now. I wish she did. I wish she would post the things she makes, but I don't think she does. Now, last teammate question is, like, who's the best person to roommate with, I guess, on the road? Um, I've only ever had one roommate because of our kind of COVID protocols. And that's my uh -huh. roommate here, Maya Vaslett, who she's a great roommate. Um, and her and I get along really, really well. So I have no complaints. Former podcast guest too. That's a good roommate. Yeah. yeah. Now, last non-hockey question is, um, if you could have a meal with anyone in the world or have lunch with anyone in the world, um, who would you pick and why? Part of me still wants to say Ryan Reynolds. Um, there's a couple people that, for more, uh, I guess, developmental reasons, I would want to kind of pick their brain or whatever. But for just a great laugh and good company, I would still say Ryan Reynolds, I think. I feel like you would give out some good advice too, so you can learn something from him at least as well. Definitely. Now back to some hockey questions now. First question is, what advice would you give a younger player who's trying to pursue a career in college hockey? Um, first of all, I would just say kind of the cliche put your head down. You have to do the work. Um, there's no way around it. There's no, there's no shortcuts you can take. Um, no matter what to get to the college level, you have to work hard. Um, the other thing I would say is if you're ever kind of picking a team, a high school team to go to, go somewhere that you're going to get seen. Because if you don't get seen, there's no way that anyone's going to pick you up. Is it easier to get seen now than it was like 10 years ago, you think, just because of like social media? It definitely is, um, but that's also very kind of geographical for someone like me or even someone like Carly Garcia. Um, we both had to leave home at 15 because on the West Coast, there's, there's very little, um, there's very few teams out there, so there's very little exposure. You really have to go somewhere that you're going to be traveling out East quite often. Well, um, I'm curious about that. Like you, I've, you said Calgary is like a big hockey area and I know that it is, but like, why is it so hard to get noticed as a women's hockey player in Calgary if it's such a big hockey area? Um, there isn't a lot of kind of elite high school midget teams. Um, there is a lot of recruitment for Canadian universities, um, teams like University of Saskatchewan, University of British Columbia, uh, University of Toronto, which are all really, really great hockey teams. Um, McGill, but it kind of 
depends what route you want to take because if you want to go somewhere in the states you need to be seen by those kind of eastern places and it's difficult for them to to get out west especially an area like that i mean for me even from state college if i fly right out of state college it's three flights for me to get home yeah. so for them that's a lot of added cost when there's a ton of talent in ontario there's a ton of talent out east so you really do have to make that effort to get out there to be seen yeah, no, that's pretty cool. It seems like uh, your team's doing a good job of recruiting those Canadian players because obviously you mentioned Rachel Weiss, one of your teammates, is also from Calgary. So it's cool that how your coaches kind of find you guys no matter where you're from. Absolutely, yeah. Now, what should be done to help grow women's hockey, in your opinion, especially in your area or like Calgary? How do you think um, – what can be done, I guess, to improve to make those um, youth teams better so coaches can come out to Calgary and see your team, uh, those teams play without those um, players leaving far away from home at a young age? Uh, I think having kind of more tournaments or even bringing some of those really good teams from the East um, and showing that you can compete against them because they are held to such a high standard. There are so many more players um, on the East Coast that colleges do want the best of the best. And if they know that the best of the best is out West, they would make that trip, I think. So, and then as far as growing the game in general, growing women's hockey, I really think it's going to be just more investment. Um, I mean, the World Juniors years and years ago, it started out not making a ton of money too. And when you invest in that and people start um, seeing it more, that's when something like that starts to take off. So I think that in women's hockey in general just needs more investment. And then um, those, those opportunities will start to come from there. It seems like it's growing significantly just because I was hearing that the gold medal game between USA and Canada was like one of the highest rated hockey games, both men's and women's in the past like four years. So I thought that was pretty interesting. I don't know if you heard that news at all. I did. And that's absolutely incredible. And it is definitely growing in the right direction. Now, one last, I guess, hockey question before the shout outs is, do you think body checking should be allowed in women's hockey? I would like to say yes. Um, I think that obviously there has to be rules around it, but girls hockey is deceivingly rough. A lot of people think that because there's not body checking, there's nothing physical really happening, which is most definitely not the case. It's a rough game. There's a lot of behind the scenes things, a lot of little chippy things that um, refs don't necessarily see either um, that are already part of the game. So I think that adding even that extra bonus of hitting um, would be pretty cool. Yeah. What are some of the behind the scenes stuff? Like, what do you mean? Like any, like, I guess, beef between the teams or not or stuff like that? Yeah. Little, little stick cross checks, little, you get really close to someone you give them a cross check in the hips or um, whatever that looks like stuff that's close enough to the body that no one's seeing it, but little kind of sneaky stick, uh, stick infringements or impingements. Yeah. I feel like it would also make refereeing the game easier because I feel like there's some refs that are super strict about it and will call anything that they feel like is a check. And then there's others that just let you play. So it's, it's kind definitely of, up to the discretion of the ref, for sure. It's, it must be frustrating as a player to know, like, I don't know, like, depending on the ref, I have to change the way I play, which I feel like is shouldn't be the case. I feel like you should play your game no matter the way. You, you should just play your game no matter who's officiating on the ice. So that's why I personally think it should be allowed. I agree. I agree with you. Now, it seems like, what's like, have you ever thrown a check in a game before, or you try to avoid that? Are you the one taking checks, unfortunately? I feel like some players are on, on that end as well. Uh, definitely. I've been on both sides. Um, I have in my hockey career taken probably a couple too many body checking penalties, mm -hmm. but I do my best to keep it clean. Um, sometimes you rub out someone just a little bit too hard or, um, like you said, it really does depend on the ref. Sometimes they're totally fine with that and sometimes that's not okay. So, um, I, I have been on both sides, but I definitely like being on the giving side better than the receiving side. I think most people feel the same way as well. It must not feel good to get checked, um, but, you know, it's part of the game, so you kind of have to learn how to do it. And I think that's another thing as well because sometimes you can't avoid um, taking a hit. So for safety reasons, I feel like every player should learn how to hit someone and receive a check as well. I agree. Now, do you have any shout-outs you want to give to any of your teammates, family members, friends, um, or just anyone that doesn't play hockey that you really want to just give them a shout-out, I guess? Yeah, I mean, I'd love to shout out my family, my mom, Sue, my dad, Bob, my puppy, Todd, back home, um, and then every one of my teammates. I love them all. Will Todd be the first dog to ever listen to this podcast? Because I've never heard that before. I think you will be. Yep. Awesome. Well, congrats to the dog for being the first one to ever listen to College Hockey <laughs> Talk. But thank you so much, Lexi, for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate your time. It means a lot to myself. 
I wish you all the best for this upcoming off season and you're going to do great. And hopefully your team comes back to the East coast because I'd love to see you play in person someday. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me.